What was it like when Alexander wept, seeing he had no more worlds to conquer? What went on in the Duke of Wellington's tent as he ordered the final charge which stopped Napoleon? Was Cleopatra really as attractive as they say that day she met Julius Caesar? Of course, we can read all about these historical events on the pages of many books or see their reenactments through film. But we can't actually experience them firsthand. We can't see and hear the vivid details for ourselves without the fog of historical translation. Or can we? Deep within the hidden halls and chambers of the Vatican, some believe there lies a device that allows exactly that, a way to view the past firsthand. Just a conspiracy theory? Perhaps. Yet, modern science is beginning to explore unconventional ways the past can be recorded and viewed, moving beyond the confines of time and space as they do. And what they are finding is astonishing. Could the ability to view the past for ourselves be a technological possibility sometime in the near future? Or perhaps it is already a possibility one known about not only by the Vatican, but by some of the greatest thinkers of our time. We saw everything. The agony in the garden, the betrayal of Judas, the trial, crucifixion. These were the shocking words of Father Pellegrino Ernetti, as recounted in the 2000 book, Le Nouveau Mystère du Vatican, The Vatican's New Mystery written by Ernetti's friend and colleague, Father Francois Brune. It was the early 1960s and the two men were sailing along the Grand Canal in Venice, Italy, discussing various biblical interpretations, when abruptly Ernetti proclaimed that interpretations were unnecessary, since it was possible to see for oneself what had actually happened. But how? Brune asked, skeptical. Ernetti explained that deep within the Vatican was a device that allowed its user to see and hear events from the past. Not a time machine that sent a person back in time, but rather a sort of time viewer, which brought the past into the present. A device which could tune into specific events of the past and display them on a screen like some sort of time-traveling television. It was called the Chronovisor. Ernetti declared, and with it he had seen not only the last days of the life of Jesus, the agony, the betrayal, the trial, crucifixion, but the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the creation of the Ten Commandments, and other biblical moments, as well as notable historical events, like a speech by famed Roman Senator Marcus Tullius Cicero, a performance of the lost tragedy, the Estes, and even events from the life of Napoleon. It must be said, Pellegrino Ernetti was not an eccentric man by nature. He was a Benedictine monk, a scientist, an author, a musicologist, and the chair of pre polyphony at the prestigious Benedetto Marcello Conservatory of Music in Venice. In other words, he was not the type of man prone to telling fantastical stories. Brune knew this, and thus he immediately began to question Ernetti about the mysterious chronovisor. Ernetti revealed that the idea had come to him many years earlier while working on a project with his colleague, Father Agostino Gemelli, at the Catholic University of Milan. While attempting to filter harmonics out of old Georgian chants, they had seemingly heard the voice of Gemelli's dead father speaking through the recorder. Intrigued, if not stunned, Ernetti began to wonder what did happen to the sounds that people made after they ostensibly disappeared. Could it really be that voices from the past were being recorded somehow? To answer his question, Ernetti brought together a team of scientists who began to work immediately. The end result, according to Ernetti, was the chronovisor. Curiously, Ernetti would not reveal the members of his team, though surely Bruno was eager to know, 
and in fact, the identities of the scientists have remained secret to this day, but for two noteworthy names. Enrico Fermi, one of the designers of the first atomic bomb, and Werner von Braun, the German rocket scientist and father of the Cold War space race. Had these historical scientists at the direction of Pellegrino Ernetti really created a way to view the past? In 1972, an Italian magazine called La Domenica del Corriere published an article which led with the headline, A machine that photographs the past has finally been invented. The article included Ernetti's account of the chronovisor alongside, most astonishingly, a photograph of the face of Jesus at the moment of crucifixion, which Ernetti had purportedly taken using the device, proof, the article asserted, of the chronovisor's existence and function. Despite the incredible nature of Ernetti's proclamations, in the years that followed, the story mostly faded from view, never confirmed, but equally never fully invalidated. For his part, Ernetti said late in his life that the chronovisor had eventually been dismantled to prevent it from ever falling into the wrong hands, which Ernetti believed could create the scariest dictatorship the world has ever seen. There are those, however, who believe that somewhere deep inside the Vatican, the chronovisor remains to this day hidden, intact, functional. Could the chronovisor really still exist? Has it ever existed? Or is it all just a hoax? Curiously, in 1988, the Vatican itself issued an official decree on the chronovisor in which it warned that anyone using an instrument of such characteristics would be excommunicated. Why would the Vatican feel the need to publicly comment on the chronovisor if it was nothing but a hoax? And moreover, why would they not deny its existence, but rather instruct their followers not to use it? For answers, we might start in the realm of science. The idea of a device able to view events from the past perhaps seems preposterous at first, except we actually use crude versions of chronovisors every day. A mirror, for one, is a sort of chronovisor. You don't actually see your reflection in real time, but rather, you see yourself a few millionths of a second before. The time it takes the light to travel from a person's face to the mirror, and then reflect back to their eyes. Looking in a mirror is, in effect, viewing the past. A telescope is another type of chronovisor. The distant galaxies a telescope views are not being viewed as they are now but millions or billions of years ago, when the light left them. Of course, the chronovisor of Ernetti was much more complex than that. While the effects of a mirror or telescope are based on distance, Ernetti's chronovisor could tune to specific times and places in the past as easily as one could change the channel on their television. To conceptualize this, Perhaps what is needed is a re-examination of what is meant by time and space. Ernetti explained that his chronovisor worked by detecting images and sounds that had been created, which were floating in space. This assertion is based on the principle that every light particle has its own unique time step, which exists externally. That is, each has its own unique key which relates to a specific point in time. In theory, by grouping, sorting, and filtering light particles according to a certain time period, it would be possible to view that time period to, as Ernetti said, detect the images and sounds floating in space. Of course, just because science can theorize its existence doesn't mean the chronovisor exists or existed. Perhaps gathering time-stamped light particles and arranging them into images is beyond the scope of mainstream modern science. However, it is mainstream science now proclaiming that, if not images, ancient sounds may actually be preserved in the environment, waiting to be unlocked and listened to. In 2006, an unbelievable story began making its way through mainstream media. Apparently, a team of Belgian scientists had, according to reports, 
been able to use computer scans of the grooves in 6,500-year-old pottery to extract sounds, including talking and laughter, made by the vibrations of the tools used to make the pottery. Could this really be true? And if so, what else then might scientists find hidden in artifacts created over the many thousands of years humans have made pottery? There exists an entire scientific discipline built around the belief that sounds may have been recorded by natural means in ways we do not yet fully understand. It is called paleoacoustics and, indeed, the mysteries of clay pottery form a part of its foundation. Consider a clay pot being spun on a potter's wheel, a pattern etched into it with a stylus that decorates its design. Compare this to the creation of early phonographs, where a needle would etch a pattern into the surface of a tin or wax cylinder. How phonographs worked was that the needle would pick up sound waves and engrave the vibrations on the cylinder. When a needle passed through the grooves a second time, the effect would reverse itself. Sound waves traveling not from the needle to the surface, but from the surface to the needle playing back the recorded sound. 